Lord, even a very warm welcome to everyone to our Sunday service at the Saviour's Church uh, this week. And it's the 17th of May and it's the 6th Sunday of Easter. And our theme is actually going to be based around the hymn we're using today because it's one of the great Easter themes. We have a gospel to proclaim. And our opening verse uh, is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. And so to our opening prayer, we ask God to be with us as we worship him together in our homes. God, our Father, may your Holy Spirit be with us during this time of our worship. Help us to come with boldness to your throne of grace. Make us conscious of your presence in our midst. Give us the freedom of your Holy Spirit. Enlarge our vision and increase our faith. And may our words and our thoughts be now and always acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. And so to this lovely hymn, it's quite a modern hymn about the good news of our faith and the life of Jesus within it. We have a gospel to proclaim good news for all throughout the earth. The gospel of a Saviour's name. We sing his glory and tell his worth. Tell of his birth at Bethlehem, not in a royal house or hall, but in a stable, dark and dim. The word made flesh, a light for all. And so, theme prayer for our service. Almighty God, who called your church to witness that you were in Christ, reconciling all people to yourself. Help us so to proclaim the good news of your love, that all who hear it may be reconciled to you. Through him who died and rose again and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. in our service where as we worship God we acknowledge our falling short of loving God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength and loving our neighbour as ourselves, particularly in this context of the example we set as Christians. Father, forgive us all that hampers our witness as Christians and our living a truly Christian life. Our busy preoccupations with lesser things which prevents us from seeing the great vision of your kingdom on earth and our calling within it. Our selfishness and self-centeredness, which holds back our involvement with others in your service. Our stubbornness, which holds us back from being truly shaped by your loving will. Our prejudices, which prevent us from embracing all people in your love and our love. Our suspicion of change, which hinders us from reaching out to people in their needs and situations. God our Father, where our faith, hope and love have fallen short, forgive us and forgive what we have been. Inspire what we are and direct what we shall be through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So to our first lesson from the Acts of the Apostles, uh, the main lesson for most of these Sundays after Easter, I know we've had very particular Sundays based on liberation, but the lectionary for this time of year uh, asks us to look at certain sermons uh, from St. Peter and St. Paul. And here we have chapter 17, St. Paul. St. Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I notice that you are religious in every way. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines, and one of your altars has an inscription on it, to an unknown God. This God, whom you worship without knowing, is the one I am going to tell you about. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples. And human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. 
He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. From one man he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God, and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Though he is not far from any of us, for in him we live and move and exist. As some of your poets have said, we are his offspring. And since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times, but now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and to turn to him. But he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. When they heard Paul speak about the resurrection of the dead, some laughed in contempt, but others said, we want to hear more about this later. That ended Paul's discussion with them. But some joined him and became believers. Among them were Dionysius, a member of the council, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So to our prayer, our collect for the week. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and give more either we than we desire or deserve. Pour down upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things in which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things which we are not worthy to ask, save for the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Amen. And so to the third verse of our hymn. Tell of his death at Calvary, hated by those he came to save, in lonely suffering on the cross, for all he loved, his life he gave. And so to our Gospel for today, which is from St John, uh, this coming Thursday is Ascension Day. It's the gospel traditionally chosen before that day as it looks forward to Jesus leaving uh, his earthly ministry. Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long the world will see me no longer, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will realise that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. One who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, and neither let it be afraid. Thanks be to God for his holy word. Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have a gospel to proclaim. It's a well-known and lovely hymn. And we know as Christians that is a profound truth. My first question this morning though is, yes, that is obviously part of our calling. But what is the message? I think the last words in Paul's great sermon today give us a clue. Paul writes, God showed us who the person is, who the centre of faith is, by raising him from the dead. And St Peter, in so many of his uh, sermons, writes uh, that lovely phrase, this Jesus whom you crucified has been raised from the dead. 
So at the centre of our gospel message is that resurrection. It is, therefore, one of the great Easter themes. I often go on about the evidence for the resurrection. It's an extraordinary claim. The way those disciples, so full of failure and distress, were transformed. The way almost every one of them went to a martyr's death. The way millions and millions of people since then have found in that truth the way, the truth, and the life. It was the resurrection. I'm slightly intrigued because we could call it the R word. There's a lot being said at the moment in our present situation about the R word being greater or less than one, uh, a statistic. But the R word for us Christians is the resurrection, the centre of our faith. And Paul makes that the centre of his message today. And we read at the end, please note, some people laughed at him because of that claim. But others came to faith. One of the great things I love about uh, the New Testament particularly, and why it's a strength to my faith for so many reasons, is we hear of real people, those two that are mentioned by name, Dionysius and Damaris, became Christians. These are real events that happen. And the resurrection is the way to show you people the message, we have much theology about how we talk about God, but the message is actually Jesus, because Jesus is the good news. One of the images Paul uses elsewhere is we are ambassadors for Christ. And the point about an ambassador is they don't wave their hands and say, look at me, I'm very important. An ambassador points to the ruler of the country, the country. We, as Christians, are to point to Jesus Christ. That's another reason why this morning's hymn is so appropriate. It's about Jesus' life, his birth in Bethlehem, his death on the cross, his resurrection on Easter Day, the hope we have in Jesus. Anyone who knows anything, I think, about Jesus' life, what he taught, how he lived, died, he rose from the dead. The story is so powerful. We sometimes get sidetracked by detailed debates about uh, faith and theology. If we could help people see this Jesus, who he is, what he taught, how he lived and loved, forgave, died for us, and broke the bounds of death by the resurrection. The story speaks for itself. If the first question is, what is our message? The second question is, how do we go about it? And I think there are three things I want to say, perhaps four. Firstly, by our actions and our values. Again, we read somewhere else in the Acts of the Apostles, people became Christians, quote, because they saw how these Christians love one another, by the quality of our love and care and compassion and kindness. Every time we know to be Christians, we are grumpy with other people, or uncaring, or worse. That actually gets in the way of the gospel message. We have a gospel to proclaim. We, each of us, could spend some of this time when life is a little bit quieter, though very disturbing, how do I go about my relationships, not only with family and friends, but those I meet in the supermarket, with those who annoy me at work, and so on? And the second thing about how is we have each of us to learn to tell our own story about why faith is important to us. I know for Church of England members that's quite a challenge, but we do live in a world increasingly where people don't know the story. And each of us, our stories will be different. For some people, faith might have come in a moment of great revelation. They may have felt God really close to them. For others, it may have been they've known faith from their earliest memories by being in a family where faith was important. People love stories. Uh, it's much more interesting than the rector preaching sermons. And each 
Christian, it's again too practical at the moment. If someone asks me why I'm a Christian, what is my story about the journey of faith? What has it meant to me? It might be about learning to be thankful. It might be a real strength in hard time keeping us going. It might be a knowledge that God loves us me so much that I don't have to start worrying about things. I'll be freed by God to be the person he wants. We all have different stories. But I ask us at this time, each of us, to think what our story is, why our faith in Christ is so important, so that we might have it there for others. A third thing which is interesting, and it comes out of Paul today, is we need to start where people are. Do you remember that lesson? He's in Athens. And we read in the verses before today that he's appalled at the way everyone's living, a life they couldn't seem to care about God, and they seem to have a multiplicity of gods. It actually says he was appalled by it. Paul does not stand up and start giving them a massive lecture about what bad people they are. He starts very differently. He noticed one of the many shrines in Athens was to the unknown God. So he actually says to them, I know you're very religious people, and gosh, isn't it wonderful? And from that he takes them to this one shrine, the unknown God. He says, I'm going to tell you about that God. So he's drawn them onto his side for the gospel. I sometimes worry about people who walk up and down Oxford Street in London with those placards saying, repent because the end of the world is nigh and you'll be damned if you don't. Um, I admire their bravery, but I think that's the opposite of what St. Paul does. St. Paul comes alongside people. And I was really struck about this recently because one of the persons, on people I'm training to perhaps be a, a church in England minister, um, we were talking about faith and he, he had to write an essay about it. And his opening point was, actually, people have to have faith every day in all sorts of ways. Faith that the sun's going to come up tomorrow. Faith that the supermarket's going to be open. Faith, faith, faith. And he went, he made the point, I'd like to start talking about faith to people to help them see they have faith every day. And therefore, this is just another, the Christian faith, is another journey of faith. And that hadn't occurred to me. Uh, and I thought that was really wonderful. And it relates to Paul. So Paul starts with where they are and then leads them to Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. And some take that. Some don't. Remember that too. It's not our job to make sure it happens. We can't corral people or beat them into the Christian faith. That's God's doing. But if we start with where people are, that's what Paul does here. And please note, if we start with where people are, it means we might have to change. I love the old language of the 1662 service, for instance. It's my favourite service. But I also know, if I'm going into one of the local secondary schools in Jersey, there's no point in me trying to tell them how, how good that service is. I think it is good. They use a different language different way of understanding things. And so, as I say this, I'm not suggesting we jettison, throw overboard, all these things that are precious to us. But if we are going to bring new people to faith, we will have to change the way we do things. And my fourth and final point linked to that is, one of the great things that our faith does is it gives us a thanksgiving for life. Every communion service, it is meet, right, and our bounden duty we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto you. It gives us thanks, as St. Paul says in the reading today, it gives us a hope. And the other thing it gives us, the last verse from our Gospel, Jesus says, my peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you. And that's not a peace that just depends on everything being easy and quiet and no problem. It's a peace in knowing that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and he walks with us every day of our life. My peace I give to you. We have a gospel to proclaim by who we are, 
by how we live, by telling our story, by the quality of those things, thanking God, good men and women and children who are thankful, being hopeful, and full of God's peace. All focusing on Jesus Christ. The last verse, and indeed I think the first verse of today's hymn, the last two lines. Our calling as we proclaim the gospel, we sing his glory and we tell his worth. Amen. And so to the fourth verse of our hymn, which is about telling that story, tell of that glorious Easter morn, empty the tomb, for he was free. He broke the power of death and hell that we might share his victory. Tell of that glorious Easter morn. And we've been having a meditation in most of our services after uh, the reflection of this on that lovely verse from the Gospels. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Peace seems to be so elusive, especially in troubled times. Fleeting, temporary, like a rainbow that disappears before I can enjoy it. And when Jesus said, my peace I give to you, he was hours away from his death on the cross. So where and what is peace? Before he went to the cross, Jesus said also, yet a little while and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live, you will live also. His peace comes from trust in him, in his promise that whatever we may face, love can never be defeated. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. I'm going to have to turn off the microphone, I'll be back in one second. to our meditation on peace that's been slightly interrupted by a noise. And here's the prayer at the end of the meditation. May God grant us peace of mind and a share of peace of quiet. But most of all, may we know his peace, which is the eye of the hurricane, the calm in the centre of the storm, the sure stillness of love that never fails. So may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of Christ. And so to the Creed, our communal statement of faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things are made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And so to our prayers of intercession for others, and I thank Georgie for uh, writing these beautiful prayers. 
Merciful God, all seeing, all knowing, and everywhere present, to you we give all glory, honour, praise, and thanks. Thank you for being our loving Father and for your promise to hear us through your risen Son, Jesus Christ, when we pray in faith. Father, we pray for your church as it daily reaches out to the ever-changing world. Give it courage to use every opportunity to speak boldly of the truth, that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. In the midst of the worldwide affliction of COVID-19, may your church be guided by the light and truth of Jesus, so that they may work together in love and unity to the glory of your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all clergy and church leaders in your service, Lord, that you may continue to strengthen them in body, mind and soul, and to carry out their shepherding duties, especially at this time, with the grace that comes from you. We pray for our own clergy and their families, as well as for our church wardens and almoners, and all in leadership positions in our church. Father, may your Holy Spirit give these shepherd leaders the wisdom and guidance they need to bring glory to you as they carry out their duties. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, give guidance and wisdom to government officials and decision makers throughout the world as they lead through this crisis of COVID-19. Give them the foresight to act with charity and true concern for the well-being of the people they serve. Guide them to find long-lasting solutions that will help to prepare for or prevent future outbreaks. Illumine the minds of men and women engaged in scientific research that they may find everlasting solutions to overcome this virus. We also pray for those in the health services who may be risking their own lives to care for sick patients. May they know your love, protection, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus Christ, you travel through towns and villages, curing every disease and illness. At your command, the sick were made well. Come to our aid now in the midst of the global spread of the coronavirus, that we may experience your healing love. Merciful God, we pray for the many people who have contacted the coronavirus throughout the world. Bring comfort to those grieving loved ones who have died and peace to those who are worried and fearful and uncertain as the virus spreads. Also heal those who suffer from all other diseases as well as all those who suffer in mind and spirit. May they regain their strength and health through quality medical care. Remember those from our own church community. And Lord, we also bring before you those known to us personally, who we now name in our hearts in a moment of silence. We are emboldened to ask that your healing touch may be felt in their lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Remember before God those who died in the faith of Christ. Lord, may they find rest and peace in your eternal kingdom. Gracious Father, may all those who have lost their loved ones to the coronavirus and other diseases feel the presence and comfort of the Holy Spirit. We pray for an outpouring of your mercy and compassion upon them. We also pray that you raise a network of friends and neighbours to support them as they grieve. Give them hope and courage not to despair. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. And Lord, we pray for those that live and die without the knowledge of Jesus, that through this crisis their hearts may be touched and quickened to the love of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for the salvation of every man, woman and child in the world today. By faith we welcome them into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for ourselves and our families. Jesus Christ, healer of all, turn your merciful eyes towards us amidst this coronavirus pandemic. 
Comfort those who are distraught and mourn their loved ones who have died, and at times are buried in a way that grieves them deeply. Be close to those who are concerned for their loved ones who are sick, and who, to prevent the spread of the disease, cannot be close to them. But with hope, those who are troubled by the uncertainty of the future, and the consequences of the economy and employment. Heal us from our fear, which prevents nations from working together and neighbours from helping one another. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We end our prayers by saying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So to the last two verses of our hymn, pointing both to the ascension, which we celebrate on Thursday, and the call to each of us with our own particular gifts to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Tell of his reign at God's right hand, by all creation glorified. He sends his spirit on the church to live for him, the lamb who died. Now we rejoice to name him king, Jesus is Lord of all the earth. This gospel message we proclaim. We sing his glory and tell his worth. And so to our concluding prayer. We praise you God our Father for morning light and the gift of this day. And with thankful hearts we now entrust ourselves and those whom we love into your hands. Pray that you will help us, guide us, keep us in all that lies before us this day and this week ahead. Be our shepherd for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so to the blessing. The spirit of truth leads you into all truth. Give you grace to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and to proclaim the word and the works of God. And the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you, and on those whom you love, and in your homes, this day and forevermore. Amen. And now go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.